The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Ah, uh, it's so frustrating not to have any content to play on this TV. I know, Packer season is over, it's completely worthless. If only we could stream media to it from our server. Exactly. As it is, the TV might as well be sold and then we could trade it in for two more pinball machines. I don't like that idea because A, the pinball machines would cost a lot more than that TV is worth by a long shot, and two, we have enough pinball machines. Well, I at least like the streaming media idea. Did somebody say streaming media? Felix! I have an idea. We could take a Raspberry Pi and turn it into a media center, connect it to the TV, and stream our videos on server to it. We could even watch our own show. That's a great idea, Felix. In today's episode, we're going to explore how to use a Raspberry Pi to create a streaming media center. Let's get started. I still think two more pinball machines would be cool. Okay, you can buy them. <sighs> <laughs> Amazing hacks. How can we make this portable? Inspired designs. I am the internet troll. Regrettable acting. Bad damn hatches! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Hack Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to be making a Raspberry Pi based media streamer that you can use with a television and a server. Here are the steps we're going to take. First, we'll choose a distribution to burn onto an SD card. This will be the Linux image that the Raspberry Pi boots up to. Then we'll connect an IR sensor to the Pi's GPIO. That way we can use a remote control with it. We'll configure the system settings to do what we need and also connect to the network, in this case, our shop network so we can get files off of our server. We'll install it into a cool custom case that we 3D print like we always love to do on the Ben Heck Show. And finally, we'll enjoy some stream content. Now, Felix has got the example set up so he's gonna guide me through the process and then we'll guide you. Let's get started. Felix here is our resident Linux expert, or at least enthusiast. Yes. And he's prepared a Raspberry Pi for us to put the Open Elect operating system on. Felix, can you tell us what these parts are? All right, we're going with the Raspberry Pi Model B. So we got our jumper wires, resistor, capacitor, IR sensor, USB network dongle, USB keyboard and mouse, USB wire for power that's going to connect to our uh, USB hub that we're just getting five volts off of, HDMI cable, remote, and then our micro SD card and SD card adapter. I see you have a class 10 SD card. Yeah, it's more reliable and lasts longer. Cool, when you buy SD cards, you'll see a little circle somewhere on the packaging with a number in it. You always wanna find class 10. A lot of the cheap ones are only class two or class four. The higher the class, the faster they go. We're going to need an image of Linux to put on this, right? Yeah. And you have Open Elect here, Open Elect Media Center? There are a number of different distributions, but I just settled with Open Elect because it seems pretty simple. Okay. Um, basically, it's got everything set up from the Raspberry Pi from the get-go. There's just a little bit of configuration once it's downloaded and written to a right. card. So we're going to scroll past the 64-bit and 32-bit versions because that would be for x86 machines and get the Raspberry Pi version for the ARM 11, which is the older Raspberry Pi. Okay, let's download this disk image. So this is a compressed GZ file, so we can unzip this with Linux, or on Windows, we could unzip it using 7-zip. And there'll be an image file in here that we're gonna burn to the SD card? Yeah. Okay, so so far it's a pretty basic Raspberry Pi install. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next? I'll navigate over to the terminal and type ls. <laughs> Did you want to do the uh, card extraction part? Sure. All I right. Can, like, yeah, I can. You're the Linux guy. All right. I'm just the show host. So I'm going to extract this uh, gzip file. So I did that with gnzip-k-d open elect. Okay, so you unzip the file. Yep. So now we have an image file. There it is. Okay. I plug the micro SD card in. Yep. And I want to see what the uh, the, name, the device name of that is, so we'll do uh, parted. Actually, I should do pseudo parted. Uh, dash L to list. And it looks like it is the generic storage device 
DEV SDE. So what I'll do is the uh, I'll issue the DD instruction to write the image to the disk. Now it's a pseudo instruction. Super user do. Yep, super user do DD IF, which is in file, and that is the open elect image, and then OF for out file equals. And make sure I have this absolutely correct, otherwise it will fry my system and I'll be very sad. Let's hope that this works, huh? All right. Now, you notice that there's no output. And I like to see output because DD doesn't spit out any output. But I have this instruction here that I put into a bash file. And sudo. And it's only about 100 or 300 megabytes, so it, by the time I get this typed out, it, may already be written. Right. An image file is a good way to create a type of data structure on a memory device, such as a card, that doesn't necessarily match the computer you made it with, but will work with your target device. OK, so we're making an image that will work with the Raspberry Pi. And now since I did that DD, or the, uh, Oh, I'm showing you the progress of it? Yeah. I'd yeah, sometimes this can be a little slow. OK, I'm going to do this on Windows as well. Here's the same file that we downloaded. I'm going to open it with 7-zip. OK, it's an ING file, which is a uh, image file. And I'll just extract it to the desktop. Obviously, the best place to extract things. OK, now here's a standalone little program that's pretty useful. It's called Win32 Disk Imager. This will allow you to make low-level images onto media, such as the SD card, which I stuck into the computer. I just want to make doubly sure that it's the right Hard drive, okay. Removable disk H is the SD card. All right, that's what we got. So let's get the file here. We're gonna just go to the desktop and get the IMG file. Okay, it looks like it's ready and right. This could take a while. Oh, this is going pretty fast. Wow. Uh, it's done already. Ha <laughs> ha, take that, Linux. <laughs> well, this is a USB 3.0 card reader, so that probably helps. So let's connect it. Let's look up the GPIO. We put the sensor in here. We're gonna go from three volts to the 100 ohm resistor. And Felix is using three volts for the IR sensor instead of five because the GPIO on the Raspberry Pi is not five volt tolerant. And that means if you put in voltage more than 3.3, it can cause damage. There are some microcontrollers that do have five volt tolerant, 3.3 volt pins. But you should always check first. And then we want to connect the capacitor between ground and the voltage supply. Hmm, so it needs additional filtering, huh? It'll help with any sort of fluctuations in the power. Okay. And then we'll want to connect to GPIO 18. So there's gonna be a program running on the Pi at all time that monitors this infrared line and then translates the pulses into keystrokes? Yeah, it's called L-I-R-C. Cool, you already got the uh, HDMI connected? Yep, it's hooked up to your laptop so we can capture it. Oh, what? Forgot the... Uh, oh yeah, you're probably gonna need that. Here. And network, and keyboard and mouse. So when this is done, we'll just need the network adapter, yep. not the keyboard and mouse. All right, ready to power it up? Yeah. All right, here we go. We're using the USB hub to provide power to the Raspberry Pi. So this connection here is only used for power. It's not used for USB communications. Here's our SD card. We have our infrared sensor over here. And it senses infrared at the 38 kilohertz range, which is what most remotes use. Then we have our keyboard and network adapter plugged into the USB port. We're not using ethernet. And HDMI is going out to this screen right here. Now it's time for a tech timeout. Felix, I noticed you did a lot of video capture of the computer screens in this episode. Mm -hmm. How did you accomplish that? Well, I tried these two different devices here, the Blackmagic Design Intensity Shuttle and the StarTech Express Card HDMI Audio Video Capture Device. Oh, okay. So this one looks like USB 3.0, and this would stick into a laptop. Mm -hmm. All right. So how did this one work? Well, I found out that the Blackmagic Intensity Shuttle was designed for uh, broadcasting so that whenever uh, an input is connected, it expects 
to have a consistent resolution. Oh, but when the Raspberry Pi boots, the screen and the resolution changes a couple times. Yep. So you lost sync. Mm -hmm. All right, but that one did handle it? Yeah, the StarTech, whenever the resolution changed, it didn't mess up, it just kept capturing. All right, well, very good work getting today's episode to capture through an HDMI device. While Felix is getting the media center ready, I'll create a cool custom case to put the Raspberry Pi into. All right, so here in Illustrator, I have the two different views of the Raspberry Pi, a top-down view and an elevation view. I've also included the SD card because it sticks out the end and takes up a lot of space, so we wanna make sure we accommodate for that. So I'm gonna design the casing around that, indicated by these dashed lines. I'll make it as small as possible, but I'll make sure there's enough thick walls that we can put screws through everything. And I'm also going to make marks where the plugs come in. We're going to have an HDMI plug and a USB plug, so I have to make sure there's enough clearance for both of those. And in the front, as you can see here, there's going to be the IR sensor, so we have to have an opening for that. So once I have the plans the way I want them in AI, I move on to Autodesk 123D. So this is a top-down view of the board. It has the mounting points and the entrance for the HDMI and the USB. And there's also a kind of a thumb hole over here so you can get at the SD card. So once I have the um, 2D design of this done, I'll start to extrude the basic shapes, such as a floor, a raised area for the posts, and the walls, which will be half an inch thick. And of course, there'll be two pieces to this top and bottom for a total thickness of one inch. I'll also combine these parts and add a fillet on the bottom to give it a nice curved edge, like so. Here is the base of the unit. We have the screw posts, an indentation for the SD card, some venting holes and our screw holes. And if we look at it from the bottom, we'll notice that we have countersunk area for each screw and we've put a chamfer on it, not a, not a fillet. We use a chamfer. I also chamfered the edges where it goes together. So it's kind of a glamour line. So if you put kind of a detail where the two halves go together, you won't notice it if they aren't perfectly lined up, which happens even with professionally injected molded products and certainly happens with 3D printed objects. Here is the top half of the case. It's fairly simple. There's a little bit of an indentation here for the top of the USB stack. We've enclosed the area around the SD card over here. And in the front, there's an opening for the infrared sensor. Okay, let's get these two halves of the case printed up. Looks like Open Elect has booted up. So let's do English. Of course. Yes, I'm British. Hello, I'm English. That's dumb. Yeah, next. Okay. Oh, uh, we don't see any networks over. I think we gotta turn on the wireless adapter. Okay, how do we do that? It's in the system menus. Okay, so we'll have to come back to this. Uh, Enable SSH, please. Mm -hmm. Samba would be file sharing, right? Yeah. Over a network. Press next, please. All right, now navigate over to system, and then open a lick and network. You're right, the keyboard probably is gonna be better. Slightly. Okay, oh, let's activate this. Mm -hmm. Enter, there we go. Okay, it looks like it's looking for a network. Mm. Whoa! Connections. Okay. Oh, there we go. Ben Hex Shop. We need to add a video source now? Yeah. So where the videos come from. All right, let's hit browse. Okay, zero conf browser. Oh, okay, there's the server, Samba server, which is for Linux. I use my own uh, network username and password to log into this. So we're going to look for episode archives. Oh, there it is. Oh, so we could easily watch all of our episodes, right? 
Okay. So should we, we should be able to see those videos now. Let's try it. All right. Then once we have this working, we'll try to do the, the remote control, right? Yep. Oh, we have to add videos? Oh, yeah. Hmm. From the source yeah. that we just added. So we had to set up a source, and now we have to actually add the videos in the source. Yeah, because the source could be movies, it could be audio, it could be pictures. Oh, oh, I get it. We're just telling it what it is. Music videos, TV shows, movies. I guess we'll call it movie. Okay, do you think the stuff will be there? What shall we predict? Yes. Okay. I predict maybe. B-roll, 113. What's it gonna be? Well, it's probably gonna be the one-handed guitar episode. Oh, oh, what's going on? Hey! Who's that guy? Hey, I've got the same sweater on. Hey, that's the one I had Theater of Magic, look. All right, well, it's not playing very well over the video capture, but it looks like it works. Maybe the server's just a little slow. Okay. That, yeah, it has been. Well, I think what we should do next is hook up the IR and get the remote working. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Cool. We've actually done everything that we need with the keyboard and mouse. Everything from here on out can be done with the infrared remote, but we need to set it up. So we're going to power it on the Raspberry Pi, remove the keyboard and mouse dongle, and then SSH into it using a separate Linux computer. SSH is, what is that, secure sockets? Secure shell. Ah, yes. So that basically means you can use one Linux computer to shell into another Linux computer and basically control it remotely. All right, so let's uh, get this powered down and shell into it. All right, uh, it's just shut down gracefully, so now we can All right. take the... What does shut down gracefully mean, Felix? Um, it will go to the Linux operating system will go through a proper shutdown procedure rather than just disconnecting the power. Okay. Uh, saving any files and uh, solidifying everything that was on the disk. So open elect is rebooting. Now are you going to shell into it to do the infrared commands? Yep. All right. And I'm going to SSH into the open elect system, which is root at, and our IP address is 192.168.1.131. And the root password for open elect default is open elect. Mm. Yeah. Pretty secure. All right, ls space dash a, uh, a l. So we want to go into the config file or directory. And what we want to do is set up the remote so that we have a lircd.conf file. There's a daemon that starts up the LIRCD daemon. We want to stop that because we can't configure it if it's running already. So, and it's configured to um, start automatically with open elect. So basically this is just simulating keyboard keys. Yep. Okay. So we'll do kill all LIRCD. All right, now we can do IR record. IR record space dash D space uh, forward. Dev LARCD. It's a lot of typing with Linux. Uh, <laughs> that's the uh, the device. Okay. And then we're going to put it into LARCD.conf. Okay. Now this is sort of a drawn out process here, but what we have to do first is identify the 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 encoding and key combinations and timing for the IR sensor. Oh yeah, because they, uh, every manufacturer uses a different type of packet. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's only like six or seven different types, but they're different. And this works pretty, pretty well, but we gotta follow the instructions exactly as instructed on the IR record. It is very important that you press many different buttons and hold time for approximately one second. Each button should generate at least one dot but in no case more than 10. Oh yeah, because some re some remotes repeat the signal over and over and over if you hold down the button and some just send it once. So this is it memorizing the type of pulses. Yeah. All right. Okay, now we can enter the names of the keys. All right. And I got a list here of the keys that I found to be the... the okay, I list. can do the remote if you want to <laughs> type in the keys. Okay, so key underscore play. 
Okay, so the keys that you're typing in, they look like just like the normal, when you're programming the kind of keys you look at for the keyboard, like key A, key B, mm -hmm. key F5, key backspace. Okay, yeah. so the syntax is the same. And then I press enter. Okay. Now so you hold it, you press the key and hold it. Mm-hmm. Now it's ready for the next one. Cool. And this remote has arrow keys, start, stop, fast forward, rewind, everything. All right, mm -hmm. what's next? Key pause. Pause, okay, ready? Oops. P-A-U-S-E. How'd you spell it, like a cat? <laughs> cat okay, pause. <laughs> okay, is that all the buttons we need? Yeah, those would probably be the best. All right. There's a whole list of many more buttons that you can configure. Now I'm gonna press ent enter to finish recording, and it's gonna ask you to tap the button really, tap one button really fast. It doesn't matter what button you gotta, but you gotta keep pressing that button. You can't hold it down. Oh, so yeah. it's like playing a video game. Yeah. I can do that. I don't It'll know how to play video games. It'll give us a warning. And okay, that I'm ready. It says checking, no, it's, it's, this is how it finds the toggle bit. It's the same button, can't hold it down, keep it, keep pressing it, and there will be some dots. All right. Quickly, quickly, You'll quickly, quickly. <laughs> hurry, hurry, hurry. <laughs> You're almost there. <laughs> All right. No toggle bit mask found, successfully written config file. That's oh. exactly what we want. Now we do reboot. And when it reboots, the daemon will start up, so then it'll start taking these commands. Yep. Cool. Okay, so we have this connected to the network. We have it connected to some videos, and the remote control is working. Looks like it's ready to try. I 3D printed a case for the Raspberry Pi Media Center. It has enough space for everything, so it should work out well. We're gonna stick in our USB Wi-Fi, and I'm gonna mount the Raspberry Pi first, and then I'll install the IR onto a little PCB. So let me get my... Do, 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 do. All right, so I'm gonna slip this PCB in place and we'll solder it directly to the GPIO and then we'll add the capacitor and the resistor. Let me just make sure that this hole I made for the IR lines up. So guys, what are we gonna watch on this new media streamer? Oh, well I downloaded an awesome possum walkthrough that we could definitely check out. Oh, I have that game. I've always wondered how to beat it. I mean, it was the finest environmentally friendly Sonic the Hedgehog ripoff on Sega Genesis I've ever played. Oh, man. The Fortress of Garbage? <laughs> <laughs> Final battle. <laughs> oh, man, it's so good. Well, he made a fortress out of garbage. That's recycling, yeah, if you ask me. Yeah, that's environmental. At least. Yeah. I think Awesome Possum is the real villain here. <laughs> For this episode, our challenge was to build a media center using a Raspberry Pi Model B. Using OpenElect and Kodi, we were able to get one working, though we weren't able to use the USB power coming from the TV itself. It wasn't quite enough juice. Video playback was very smooth, even on the older Raspberry Pi, so I'm pretty happy with the outcome. It might be fun to try this with an even smaller Pi form factor, such as the A+. That thing's really small. What would you have done differently in this build? Have you ever put together a media streaming device or used an old computer to create network attached storage? Let us know what you did on the Element 14 community, where you can also keep track of upcoming builds, episodes, and events. We'll see you next time. Can fix it. That'd be even worse than when the lamp fell on it. <laughs> we had a horrible lamp accident one time on the show. Taft Possum. I could have my own line of toys. Not by a long shot. <laughs> the King of Snakes. <laughs> Wasn't Drew Mary Moore in a movie with uh, the guy who's supposed to be funny and he yells and screams a lot? Oh, Adam Sandler? <laughs> yeah, she's been in like three movies with him. <laughs> I still think two more pinball machines would be cool. Okay, you can buy them. <sighs> <laughs> Fake click. Actually, it still needs to be downloaded. Oh, so real click it. <laughs> Felix! <laughs> How dumb! 
The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.